even though Jen is not here. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the Pacific Region Forum on Business and Management Communication. I'm Rosalie Tung, Professor of International Business and Associate Director of the Data Plan Center for International Communication. Our speaker this afternoon is David Drake, who is Minister of Counselor of Economics at the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo, Japan. Mr. Drake has an extensive career in the Canadian government in both multilateral and bilateral relations, including as co head and chief negotiator for the UNFCCC and Kyoto Protocol, and head of Canadian delegation in global forest negotiations in the UN system. Mr. Drake has also worked in the Canadian International Development Agency and the United Nations Development Program. The title of his talk today is North East Asian Economic Integration, a Canadian View from Japan. Mr. Drake's presentation will be followed by a question and answer period. Without further ado, I'll turn the floor to David. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Tom. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, in, uh, in, in Vancouver. Um, I'm, uh, I'm here for, for a, a variety of, uh, of reasons. One is that this is the 75th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Canada and Japan. It, uh, it turns out that it's the 100th anniversary of Canada's, uh, uh, of Canada's uh, uh, trade relations with Japan and the 126th anniversary of the first Japanese immigration to Canada. So we have a long and, uh, and strong uh, connection and this year we are, we are celebrating that. And, uh, uh, people like myself from, from the embassy uh, are, are crisscrossing Canada to, uh, to, uh, to highlight Japan and uh, its, its importance uh, to Canada. Uh, one of the things which we are doing uh, uh, now, um, uh, it, at this time, uh, is uh, working with our, our colleagues uh, in the Canadian embassies throughout Northeast Asia to look at the new growth in Northeast Asia and try to get a better sense of what this means and what it means for Canada. And uh, with our colleagues in Beijing, in Seoul, in, uh, in Hong Kong, in Taipei, um, and increasingly even uh, farther afield to our, our colleagues in Moscow, we are, we are looking at a changing Asia and, uh, and a changing Japan within changing Asia and uh, trying to get a, a better sense of what this, uh, what this may mean for us. Uh, the, the main question we're asking ourselves at this point is, yes, I mean, we are all, we're all familiar that there's a tremendous amount of growth going on in China in particular, but is there something greater going on that is the, by which the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? Uh, clearly, Japan is profiting from Chinese uh, growth, as are other, uh, are other countries in the region. Um, but is there something else happening? And, and do we need to pay attention to this uh, in terms of uh, understanding uh, what, what our interests are from, uh, from this side of the Pacific? So we're just starting this process. We've given it some thought. We're working quite closely with uh, some uh, colleagues in Japan. Uh, uh, and um, I think it, it's fair to say that we, we really don't have answers. So much of what I'm going to say I ask you to look at in terms of more questions, uh, observations, uh, and, and uh, uh, we very much, I, certainly I, but my colleagues in, in Tokyo who would very much like to be here with, uh, with you today, uh, who've done so much work on this, would uh, very much like to sort of hear from you. So I'm going to try to keep my presentation uh, as short as I can and look forward to your questions. And uh, I'm not sure that I have answers, but per perhaps some, some reflections. And, uh, and I look forward to the dialogue which comes from that. So let me just get underway. Um, what I'm going to cover is, uh, breaks down into the, into the following here. First of all, look at Japan in perspective. There is a tendency to overlook Japan uh, these days, particularly with the growth in China. But just put Japan in perspective. Uh, secondly, rising Northeast Asia. Just talk a bit about what's happening economically. Uh, thirdly, Japan and Northeast Asia. Fourthly, North American economic integration. If we're going to look at what may be better, what, what may be larger than the sum of the parts, it's economic integration, the process of econo economic integration, and what the parallels may be with, with Northeast uh, Asia. We have, we have a, a significant amount of, uh, of knowledge here in Canada, and uh, what does it mean? Uh, and then furthermore, what does this mean for Canada? What does the whole thing mean for Canada and Northeast Asia? And just venture a few, um, a few, uh, a, a few remarks in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, I guess I should start by, by uh, first of all, s saying what I'm not talking about. Um, because um, as we discuss this amongst ourselves, we, we increasingly see that uh, the, the people lead to conclusions. What we're looking at is economic integration, which is happening at, at uh, sort of below the radar. It's happening in, in many different ways, and, and it, it's reflected in many, uh, in many different uh, uh, forms. 
Um, and uh, it's, we're not talking about the sort of thing which uh, Prime Minister Koizumi has referred to recently as uh, a kind of a, uh, moving towards a, a, an East Asian community. That's really something which is, is separate and, and comes much longer. But there, and it, it certainly, uh, from our perspective, is something which is going to take much longer. But at this point in time, we are looking at, uh, at, 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 at uh, in, in, uh, increasing uh, integration uh, of the economies of the area. And certainly, Japan, with the second largest national, uh, national economy, uh, is, uh, is a big part of that process. So what we're looking at, again, is not, uh, is not so much a, uh, an overall uh, uh, change, a uh, political process, but, but a, a, an economic process which is happening uh, bit by bit and which is being reinforced by governments uh, uh, as, things, uh, as things move. Let's look a bit at uh, Japan in perspective. And uh, I'm... Um, uh, let's and, and just look backwards before looking forwards. Um, my, my purpose here is not to uh, describe uh, the, the, the uh, resurgence in the Japanese economy. I can certainly respond to that question. That's mostly what I've been talking about uh, uh, in my time in Western Canada, but, uh, but certainly uh, just enough to get people, put things in perspective, then move on to the wider integration issues. Uh, you're all aware that uh, Japan has, has uh, suffered from years of stagnation. Uh, it's been, there have been assets and, and goods uh, price deflation, you, the apocryphal stories of during the time of the bubble that uh, the area of the Imperial Palace was worth more than the real estate value of California and so on and so forth. It certainly is something which uh, has, uh, it was a real phenomenon in terms of, uh, of, an, of an inflated uh, asset uh, bubble and it burst at the end of the 1980s, uh, uh, provoking a severe banking crisis, financial market collapse, and and, and so forth, and there have been a series of false starts uh, during this, this time would have, which have got uh, people uh, a little gun-shy, I think, about, about declaring that the Japanese economy is on the road to recovery. Public finances have been in, uh, in a dire situation. The Japan has the highest deficit uh, and uh, gross GDP ratio in the industrialized world is really quite staggering. Uh, but uh, but uh, things are looking more positive, and uh, uh, just a, a few indications. Um, there are many slides I could put up uh, to explain what's happening in, in Japan. Uh, and there are many different indicators, but I'll just use one here, and that's real GDP growth. Uh, it certainly has picked up, and in fact, in the, in the third quarter of, uh, of 2000, excuse me, the fourth quarter of 2003, uh, it's uh, estimated that uh, real GDP growth was actually 7%. One has, to, uh, one has to mitigate this with, uh, with deflation, and it actually comes out around uh, sort of 2.3, somewhere to, to 3. The figures are slightly different and have been slightly adjusted even since then. But the IMF now expects about 3% growth in Japan in 2004, and uh, this growth is due to the strength of exports and investments, and that's where Northeast Asia starts to, uh, starts to play in. Again, there are many other uh, indicators to, Japanese, uh, uh, to the Japanese economy. It's a huge economy, and uh, one needs to look at a whole variety of things. But I could certainly discuss that if, you, if you'd like afterwards, but I I'll just move on. Um, let's look at Japan's economy in perspective. I, I love this slide because it just sort of does, it does help to, to, uh, to put things in, in, in a different perspective. I mentioned that Japan is the second largest national economy. Uh, it's about 13.5% of world GDP. Uh, the economy of the 200-kilometer radius around the center of Tokyo is equal to that of the UK and France. Now, that's a population of about 50 million people, and France has a population of about 50 million people. So you can get a sense of the, of the wealth, which is in Tokyo alone, and how that, uh, how that affects, um, uh, it gives you a bit of a, a perspective on, on at least a, even just a part of Japan. Now, Japan has been struggling with, uh, with, with slow or, or no growth for some time, and we're looking at uh, perhaps 3% uh, growth in the next year. Uh, but even modest growth at 2%, 2% uh, annual growth in Japan is equal to adding the output of Singapore and Malaysia to the world economy every year. It's a very big country with a big economy, and uh, uh, while we are not going back to the boom years, even 2% growth is very significant, uh, and uh, one needs to keep this into perspective. Now, the numbers are even more incredible when, when you start looking at uh, the yen. The yen is about uh, 85 uh, cents or, or 85 yen or so to the Canadian dollar at this point in time. But uh, in 2001, Japan's uh, net foreign position, that is what the world owed Japan, was 36% of GDP, which is over 179 trillion yen. That's Canadian 2 trillion. Individuals' financial assets uh, amount to approximately 1,400 1, trillion yen. That's a quadrillion 
we don't get to use the, the word quadrillion very much uh, in, in Canada, but uh, here it is in the Japanese context. That represents 280% of GDP and about Canadian 17 trillion. And then finally, outstanding government bonds, this is just normal Japanese government bonds, are 450 trillion yen, and that's double all developing countries' combined debt. Just to put things in perspective about where, where Jap the Japanese economy is. Uh, and this is just a, just a quick slide just to give you a sense of Japan, um, uh, where it stands out with regard to, uh, to GDP. Uh, Japanese uh, GDP is comparable to major groupings of countries, France, UK, and Italy, for example, and then the rest of Asia. And then you can see how it works here. And just to be, just to be clear, it's the second largest national economy, the EU, which is a grouping of, of economies, uh, and increasingly an economy, uh, uh, comes in between the US and Japan. You can see uh, Canada very far down, and, and China still growing very quickly, but still quite small uh, at, at this point in time in comparison. Now, one important part uh, of, of the whole puzzle, which, uh, which I, I just leave you with, and I'm sorry this is a rather flawed slide, but, uh, and I'll explain why. But it's important to the rest of the of the uh, of the uh, of the presentation is that um, Japan is a research and development leader, and during this time of, of the last decade, actually uh, close to 14 years, uh, that uh, I talked about at, in the beginning, Japan continued to invest in research and development, both private and uh, and public. And what this doesn't show is 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 how that happened on both sides of private and public R&D. And secondly, this, does on, this only shows G8. Uh, this is a slightly old, these are slightly old uh, figures. The ja Japanese uh, uh, figures are now up uh, around 3.3. But uh, on, on, if you look at the industrialized countries, you'll see Sweden and, uh, uh, Sweden and, uh, and Finland uh, above Japan uh, uh, in terms of per, per GDP. Uh, but Canada is 14th. So this is something which we need to keep in mind in terms of uh, 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 R&D has very much fueled Japanese, uh, Japanese growth and continues to do so, and that plays into the Northeast Asian, uh, Asian area and, and the global economy. Uh, and, but this is an important reminder, even though it's, it's not by no means a complete slide. Let's look at Northeast Asia in perspective. And we'll just throw some, some figures up here. And uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm actually missing a couple of my key slides, but I'll, uh, I'll just uh, uh, talk about uh, some of these things. Northeast Asia's share of world exports is about 19% now. Um, and in 2002, you can see Northeast Asia uh, contribution to the world export growth was about 40%. This is during a, quite a, a fairly stagnant period. Europe is largely, uh, the, the rates are largely more abundant at this point in time, and the US has been, has been uh, declining. Uh, at least up until recently. And real Northeast Asia GDP as a percent of world GDP was 21% on, a, on, a, on a, uh, a purchasing power parity basis. And this is an increasingly important, uh, an important uh, figure as we, uh, or me method of calculation. Uh, any, Northeast Asia is a lead technological pole, and there are, there are a whole series of, of uh, figures, which I, I won't refer to now, which, which, uh, uh, which uh, make that uh, uh, very clear. If you look, I'm sorry, this is a bit complex. This slide, but the the top uh, the, the the top figures in each case are um, are, are for the up, are for 2003 and lower, um, uh, and for 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 and the lower figures are for 1996, and these are in Canadian billion. Um, so um, and then within parentheses, this is the rate of change, um, uh, percentage change. Uh, and one little thing, uh, Korea's exports are estimated on about 12 months results, but uh, it's, it's fairly, fairly good here. So you can see uh, a, a major Northeast Asian, uh, uh, three of the, of the big parts of the puzzle. And of course, enormous growth. Uh, uh, just looking at, at uh, for example, uh, Korea, China, 217% growth. Uh, uh, likewise, uh, a significant growth in, in, in return, but certainly it's done very well for, for Korea. Uh, between Korea and Japan, not actually uh, really significant growth in, in, in comparison, but uh, important nevertheless, uh, particularly as the two countries look at each other now in terms of establishing possible free trade agreements. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, of course, enormous growth between, uh, between J Japan and China. Uh, so this has been happening over time, and uh, it gives you a general picture, uh, if not uh, completely uh, complete, uh, because of the, the role of Hong Kong and, uh, and obviously Taiwan and, uh, and some, some others, uh, others in the area. Always a little hard to define Northeast Asia. And as I say, uh, uh, we're increasingly starting to look at Northeast Asia as uh, including Russia as well, because of the importance of the energy trade into, into this. 
Now, this is just to give a bit of a sense of how things are accelerating, and you can see that uh, there's a bit of an adjustment taking place in Hong Kong. This is largely accounting uh, changes, uh, showing uh, imports in Hong Kong uh, uh, down here, but, but things are, are just picking up across, uh, across the board. Um, and uh, you can see that there was a, there's a, only the U.S. is really is really sinking there. Uh, in Hong Kong, you've had a series, you've had a, uh, what's, what's called round tripping, in which you have a, a, a certain amount of, uh, of uh, Chinese incentives uh, to to uh, to import, uh, and uh, there's sort of it, they, they, then uh, a Chinese company in Hong Kong uh, or or outside uh, pours uh, money right from the mainland in through Hong Kong and then back into China and gains an incentive. And that's a part of the problem which you see in Hong Kong here. But certainly across the board, over one year, on one year period, you can see a significant change in, in the area. Um, China, no question, China is the, uh, is the driving force of Northeast Asian growth. 9.1% uh, GDP growth in 2003. Enormous increase in import demand. Um, and, and we're really looking at the rise of China as a global center for manufacturing, I in addition to a, a, a huge uh, uh, demand uh, increase, uh, domestic demand increase, and I'll come back to some of that as well. Uh, demand increase for housing, automobiles, agricultural goods, and certainly Beijing Olympics presentation and Shanghai uh, uh, preparation and Shanghai Expo are both having Im uh, having impacts, including on Japan, which is uh, which is uh, uh, providing a lot of uh, heavy machinery for that uh, for that process. Let's look a bit at Japan, and Northeast Asia. Sorry, I'll just put the. For some reason, this is. Um, uh, got uh, some kind of animation going. But in any case, here, if we look at Japan, no question that Japan is the, the much of the Japanese uh, uh, Japanese growth at this point in time is based on, on, uh, on China. 80% of growth in exports over the last 12 months is due to Chinese demand. And there is a, a change, a, a visible change, a qualitative change in, in, in relationship here. In 2003, for the first time, China surpassed the United States as, the United, as, the, as Japan's major, uh, uh, major uh, tra trading partner. In terms of imports to Japan, uh, China, uh, uh, People's Republic uh, uh, alone. In terms of uh, exports from Japan, uh, combined with Hong Kong and Taiwan, it surpassed the United States and the U.S. Uh, share is dropping. Um, so you can see a realignment uh, over the last uh, over the last few years, and uh, you, obviously the, the, the China curve is very significant. For industry in Japan, this has been very significant. It's meant a comparative advantage and a, tr and a boost for traditional industries such as steel. The, d the Chinese demand for, for, uh, for high quality steel is such that it's literally saved the Japanese steel industry, which a couple of years ago looked like it was going to, uh, like, like, like it was going to disappear. There are not enough deep water ports to bring in, uh, to bring in the, the raw material into China. And uh, furthermore, uh, there simply isn't the processing capacity uh, or the power availability uh, to, to, to do that in China. So the Japanese have done very well in that regard in for something which was seen to be a more abundant industry or something approaching that. And certainly there's been a push for moving exports up the high, higher value added chain and that's where we get back to the issue of a research and development and the importance of that uh, to, the, uh, to Japanese economic resurgence. Um, here, this is just a bit of an example uh, of uh, Japanese trade uh, uh, going up uh, over the last uh, over the last while, and you can see over the last couple of years, vehicles, electrical machinery, machinery, iron and steel, plastics, and organic chemicals, uh, Japan, uh, China trade led in in all cases uh, here. That's where uh, Japan's making its money, and you can see the figures are really uh, astounding. Um, Japan export uh, uh, growth is revealing that. Uh, the, it's, com it's a comparative advantage in cars and electrical machinery and steel. Uh, China has, uh, has, uh, has even uh, has developed into the world's largest um, uh, the, uh, market for, uh, for uh, um, uh, high-tech components uh, uh, and, and high-tech, uh, 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 certainly, um, um, uh, assembly in, in some cases, but it, it's the largest, uh, 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 largest market for, um, uh, for cell phones, and uh, the Japanese have done extremely well in that regard. So strong demand for, for components and, and capital goods and, and commodities and for investment, of course. Um, total capital formation has been the main driver of, of, uh, of uh, Japanese exports to China. Uh, but dependence on exports leaves the Japanese recovery uh, vulnerable. 
Export growth uh, is, uh, is, the main, uh, is clearly the main contributor to the exceptional performance in the latter part of 2003. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, as I mentioned, it's the, it's the fastest in 13 years. This is ha uh, quite uh, unique, and it is different uh, than what's happening uh, elsewhere. Japanese exports to China are very different from those to the United States and the EU, uh, which are mainly consumer goods. Uh, uh, China is importing large volumes of capital goods, and I mentioned uh, the impact of the, of the of, of, for example, sending construction equipment uh, for, the, uh, for the Beijing Olympics and so forth, and, and, and construction across China. Uh, high value added, and, and, and it, it really truly boosts the corporate for, for profitability. It's, it's, uh, uh, and, it's, uh, and this is less Im impacted by, by rising yen than it is with, uh, with the declining American dollar. Um, the composition of Japan's exports is also changing increasingly. Again, high, high value, and, uh, and the components, uh, production capital, consumer goods uh, uh, um, uh, assemble el elsewhere, particularly in China. Our, our colleagues, um, uh, colleagues in one of the main Japanese departments uh, su suspect that, uh, that uh, for every $100 uh, that Japan exports in, in, uh, in the on electronic side, Japan makes $30 to $40. Uh, dollars. It's a very good question. It's a very good question. I, I, I would have come to that eventually, but but uh, but it's it's. Uh, uh, I don't actually have figures on that because a lot of it is corporate data, and it's uh, it, a lot of it is. I think that's really those. Are, that's one of the levels of 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 uh, of, uh, of, of, of of investigation where we really need to we need to pay more attention because a lot of this is 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 corporate. Uh, investment even within the company, and that doesn't show up on the radar screen. So I, I actually had a uh, a slide uh, which, which I don't I don't have right now, unfortunately, but uh, which we use. But we actually have stopped using the slide because it clearly doesn't show the the whole picture. The official uh, the, the official um, uh, the statistics don't show it. Um, Japan's changing view of China. Even a year ago in in, uh, in Japan, there was a sense that China was a uh, was a real uh, was a real threat. I think there was in, in Japan there is a there is a, uh, a vivid uh, and uh, an important debate about China. But I think on balance, even a year ago, that uh, that was one of um, uh, of, uh, of a sense of uh, more of a threat than an opportunity. However, in, increasingly, as we, we look, we, we work uh, in our embassy, work very closely with some some Japanese institutes, and these are Japanese. Uh, uh, figures Japan, it, the, the feeling is that Japan actually competes directly with China in less than 10% of the of industrial sectors. Um, and plus, Chinese products have high import contents from Japan. Uh, low value goods tend to be produced in China, whereas high end uh, products still manufactured in Japan. And the Japanese are very concerned about maintaining that advantage of the high end, high yield, uh, which they have invested in uh, even through the dark, through, through dark years. Um, uh, many dark years of, uh, since the, the, the boom crash in, uh, in, in, 1990, in the early 1990s. Um, and here, here's a, a, a one, of the, one of the questions about in intra-industry trade. It comes back to your question uh, and, of course, the investment, uh, the investment figures that go along with that. Uh, production networks in East, in East Asia are distinctive. Uh, they are a substantial part of each country's economy. The trade in foreign affiliated companies in China is such that it's 58% of total, uh, this is Japanese of course, of total imports, 53% of total exports. Japanese firms have a central position, 22% of all Asian imports and exports to Chinese affiliates are 24% of total Japanese exports. 40% of Japanese firms in East Asia are SMEs. It's not just, it's not just big companies, it's not just Toyota, it's not just Honda and so forth. We're actually starting to look at some other little indicators and largely anecdotal indicators to just sort of t to check against the figures because the figures clearly don't tell you everything. Um, uh, little indicators like um, there are 23 flights into Shanghai every day from Japan. And why that's almost one an hour. But why is that an issue? Because there's not enough and there are Japanese companies setting up Chinese air, airlines in China because there are not there you don't have the capacity in Japan to fly Japanese to China um, uh, to, to into Shanghai just to, to capture that market there are no more slots on the Japanese side so that they're investing on their side that's a form of integration which is hard uh, to uh, which is hard to find in figures 
Another, uh, another uh, anecdote I just, uh, I just, uh, just mentioned uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of an increasing integration and a sense of integration uh, is that uh, China has gone from being the world's, uh, uh, from being a, 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 a in, uh, self-sufficient in petroleum to the world's second largest produce, uh, 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 second largest consumer of petroleum. Japan and, and China, therefore, are functionally in competition with each other in the global market, and certainly, uh, in, in the case of an emergency where there, there was a, uh, a, a halt in flows uh, to, to East Asia, uh, Japan is genuinely concerned that it doesn't want to get into a bidding war with China. China has no buffer stocks to be able to deal with such a situation, so Japanese interests are actually working in China to build Chinese buffer stocks. Not because it's good for China, because it's good for Japan. And that's, that's a form of integration which goes beyond just trade figures. Um, it's, it's, an, it's new thinking. It's thinking about where, 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 uh, which sort of demonstrates that there's a sense, a sense of regionality which doesn't play out in, in, as much in the economic figures and even in the terms of how people think of themselves. Uh, we're working with uh, the University of Tokyo, uh, Professor uh, Inoguchi at the University of Tokyo, who's done, done some, uh, some studies about what, what people think about themselves in Northeast Asia. And it's clear that uh, Chinese do not think of themselves as Northeast Asian or Asian. J Japanese don't think of themselves as Northeast Asian or Asian. Koreans do because they're smaller and they need to see them. They, they need to see themselves, of course, as, as part of a wider, uh, a wider community, but uh, the two larger countries don't. But things are happening which, uh, which, uh, which uh, belie uh, the, the sense of, of, of separateness, which, which will endure for some time, I'm sure. Uh, again, booming trade. There are two forces at play. Uh, I've mentioned the new lease on life, uh, Japan's exports uh, up, and up the, up the, uh, the value-added chain. The domestic economy is evolving in response. The export boom is a driver of uh, domestic structural change. And here, we tend to, economists, and right now the, the, the financial community will tell you that much of the Japanese resurgence is based on, 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 uh, on, export, uh, on the export boom, notably to China. But it's much more than that. Japan does not, does not rely on, uh, to the same extent as Canada, certainly Canada's the other end of the spectrum. Japanese, uh, Japanese, the Japanese economy is largely a domestic economy. It's not reliant, uh, heavily reliant on, on overseas, uh, uh, overseas exports, uh, exports to overseas. So, um, uh, so what, what, this is, what this has done over the years is it's protected Japanese industries from exposure to international competition. Much of what is happening now through the export boom is, is exposure of our entire product, production chains in Japan to overseas competition, and that's changing Japan. Even, uh, even uh, companies which were formerly very much domestic companies are being exposed uh, by a, a wider, uh, by a changing set of economic circumstances. And uh, to us, that's more significant, actually, than, than, the, than the, the, in terms of longer-term change than the, uh, than the China factor itself. Integration uh, gives momentum uh, it's, uh, to, to, to governments. As I, as, uh, it's certainly our conviction, and I know that the, our colleagues in the Asia-Pacific Foundation of Canada, which, who we've been working with, have the same, come up quite independently with the same uh, perspective. Uh, the, really what's happening is, is below the radar screen. It's happening, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thousand business de, uh, decisions a day. It's not the government's pushing. But what you have now is a series of, of FDAs uh, being led by, uh, largely by China. Uh, uh, Japanese uh, feeling is that these are politically motivated, uh, less uh, economically motivated. But Japan certainly is scrambling to catch up, and there are a series of, uh, of um, uh, FDAs underway uh, between um, uh, both in, in terms of ASEAN uh, with, uh, you've got the ASEAN Plus 3 with Japan um, uh, coming up, ASEAN China. Uh, Japan uh, is, is, is under, has uh, FTAs um, announced, in fact, just finalized, or almost finalized with Mexico, Korea, Thailand, Philippines, and Malaysia, as well as ASEAN. Um, Korea is, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, negotiating with, with uh, Chile, Japan, and Singapore. Japan has already concluded with Singapore. And China is looking at, uh, and the China, Japan, and Korea are looking at some kind of a trilateral agreement. This is governments catching up. Uh, to what's already happening, and and trying to uh, trying to facilitate uh, what's what's already there, um, as uh, as it's noted in the second point, only five percent of present interregional trade is using preferred tariffs. Uh, 
So there's high potential for FDA. Korea is not quite sure what, whether that works in their favor in terms of Japan, but it's going forward. Um, but this is um, all, what, uh, all this growth is happening essentially without FDA free trade agreements, and, and that's interesting in itself. Uh, it points to uh, different levels of sustainability and, uh, and a different leadership. Now, increasingly, another thing which we're giving some thought to is the uh, Japan-China-USA triangle. And this is a, a very, um, a very uh, uh, rough uh, uh, schema that we put together, which really tries to explain uh, what's happening in the area. You have, uh, first of all, let's just look from Japan-US. You have, well, let's Japan, China first. I mean, you've got China, you've got, a certain, you've got a trade surplus with Japan, and investment technology and policy advice are, are flowing in uh, from, from Japan. Um, for between uh, China and Japan, of course, you've got uh, uh, savings uh, going into the USA in the, in the form of, uh, of uh, China uh, maintaining uh, the, the renminbi and, uh, and buying uh, American assets, uh, and notably bonds. A trade, there's a trade surplus uh, uh, with, with China, which works in, in China's favor with the, uh, with the U.S., and, uh, and that's, that's two sides of this. On the Japanese side, again, you've got a trade surplus, tech-based tech, uh, uh, trade surplus, and then enormous savings coming in from Japan as Japan uh, uh, attempts to, uh, uh, to slow the appreciation of the, uh, of the yen against a, a collapsing U.S. dollar. Why is this significant? Well, if you start looking at the sheer numbers, in, in 2003, Japan, which is by far, uh, uh, by, by far outranks uh, uh, the, the Chinese uh, phenomenon uh, in this regard, uh, um, Japan uh, spent 30 trillion yen holding up the, uh, to try to slow down the uh, appreciation of the yen. 30 trillion yen, which basically has, has largely gone into buying U.S. bonds and other assets. If you add China, which is a smaller, perspective, smaller but also very important um, uh, to, to that, really what you have is China and Japan buying and supporting the U.S. deficit. And the increasing questions in the global monetary scale about whether or not this triangle is setting up a new kind of, of international finance and whether or not it's sustainable. The numbers are so great that you have two countries, with, uh, one of which closely allied to the United States, one which is not, uh, fundamentally holding much of the, uh, of the American economy. What does this mean to Canada? Uh, what does this mean to the rest of the world? And certainly something to start thinking about in terms of uh, where, uh, where we go from here. Um, North American integration, and just a few thoughts about the parallels with Northeast Asia, and this is fairly rough, but uh, I, I'm fortunate to have uh, as my boss the uh, uh, former Deputy Minister of Trade um, uh, of Canada, uh, Rob, uh, Rob Wright, and uh, he's, uh, he's uh, given some thought to this, uh, as well as uh, those amongst us who work for him. Um, this, uh, there, are, there are parallels to be drawn with uh, pre-NAFTA economic integration. First of all, expanding trade with North America in the 1980s was also led by business. It wasn't something which was, uh, which was government-led, although we were starting to look at, uh, at a Canada-US uh, uh, FTA. Business was moving towards North American production and distribution networks. And government recognized the need for new institutional structures. So things were concentrating in North America, and the governments were starting to look at this. Very similar uh, as, as things are now. What happened in NAFTA was, it was an accelerated North American integration. The transition period was scheduled to be about 15 years, but integration accelerated way faster than expected, and that's where we start asking questions about what's happening in Northeast Asia, and will the process of integration actually drive things more than just Japan, Korea, and others riding the Chinese dragon? So um, you can just so, some, some, some indications here, and certainly in Canada, you can see that if, for, from our perspective, uh, NAFTA uh, significantly increased uh, our perspective vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world towards, uh, towards NAFTA. Uh, just to give a sense of where, where we stand now, I mean, NAFTA uh, is, is now the world's largest trading bloc. Uh, the EU stands behind, but Asia is, is also uh, there, and that, what that does not reflect is, is uh, real growth in Asia uh, from, uh, from 2001 uh, through, 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 through 2002. We basically have four main uh, economic blocks now, NAFTA, EU, Asia, and that is much higher now, and the, and the rest of the world, and we have to start thinking in these terms. 
the lessons learned over the last 10 years, uh, North American economy, uh, economic integration was led by the business sector and, econ and integration has been taking place for some time, accelerated by free trade, as I mentioned. NAFTA has been a success for its members, although differently for different countries. And there's a variety of uh, there's a variety of views about uh, about some aspects, and including, of course, uh, the social uh, aspects of that. But certainly from an economic perspective, uh, and certainly for Canada, and and this this project uh, this process of, of economic integration will uh, will continue. So let's just look at this in terms of Northeast Asian integration. Certainly, FDO, FDAs could in, uh, accelerate integration, but the process will continue in any case. It's business-led, so it's really facilitating as it was in, in, terms, of, uh, in terms of NAFTA. Integration is beyond the economic sphere. Uh, inter integration beyond the economic sphere, like the European Union, as I mentioned, is not likely in the, in the midterm. It's, in fact, it's hard to see where, it's ha where it would happen even in the slightly longer term. But we are seeing changes in Northeast Asia, uh, and, and uh, as as, uh, econ as uh, um, uh, economies become uh, less disparate uh, in the area, things are happening, uh, such as uh, Japan and Korea are dropping their uh, their visa requirements for business, and now it's much easier for Japanese and business uh, and Koreans who are more or less on the same level to travel for, uh, easily. There's now a, a shuttle service between uh, domestic airports. Uh, uh, Haneda and Kimpo. Uh, it's no longer going through the, the international airports uh, of, Seoul, uh, of uh, Narita and Incheon. It's, it's showing that uh, once you get closer to a level of, uh, of, of some, some balance, there is, there is now uh, less fear that, uh, that, uh, that one country uh, represents uh, you know, a threat to the, uh, to, to the other. Uh, and the nature of emerging uh, Northeast Asia will depend on how the region obviously deals with important challenges, obviously uh, the, the, the North Korea, and rising energy needs and, and limited supply alternatives. I mean, increasingly we have to look at the area in terms of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, as an area which, is, which does not produce uh, uh, a significant uh, energy uh, in, uh, of uh, traditional energy sources as one which needs to uh, work out some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, 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 piece about how this uh, how this uh, is is shared overall, and there's where Russia, and uh, and even in Japan, uh, prepared to go to as as far as uh, as Iran and defy the Americans to uh, uh, to um, uh, their very close uh, allies, the Americans to uh, to, to secure uh, fuel. So what does this mean for for Canada and and its its interest in Northeast Asia? First of all, let's put things in a bit of perspective. Uh, you can see that uh, there, there's a couple of different things going on here. Uh, obviously, Japan trade has been enormous, and um, and it, it has declined uh, during the uh, during the 1990s, and it has more or less stabilized at around uh, around uh, two uh, two uh, uh, twenty billion in each uh, well, ten billion in each direction. But it's uh, it's it's stable or slightly declining. We have trouble with the figures, which we're actually working with StatsCan to try to work out. Um, but you can see that uh, overall, uh, uh, things are not, uh, things are not uh, all that rosy, even with China. And certainly, more up-to-date statistics than this will show you that Canada is not grabbing the brass ring to the, to, in traditional ways, in terms of its traditional exports, uh, with China. Uh, in terms of the growth in China at this point in time. So we need to think about how we deal in new ways. And I think things like investment and so forth are, are things that we need to think about outside the, the traditional box. New strategies for Canadian business, obviously. Uh, Canadian businesses uh, might want to think about looking at Northeast Asia strategies. We're interested in talking to, uh, to some major firms, uh, for example, a big German firm, which has, uh, uh, which is essentially established uh, in Tokyo as its, uh, as its hub um, uh, for Northeast Asia in a Northeast Asian strategy. It remains to be seen whether that's uh, a blip or whether it's the beginning of a trend, but it's, it's an interesting concept. Japan is clearly looking for innovative models to meet its regional demands. And uh, certainly we're starting to look at uh, whether we should be looking at complementary uh, opportunities for, for Canadian high value sectors, a high penetration of Chinese market by Japanese affiliated companies. The Japanese have been in China for a long time. They're well established and, they are, uh, and they're doing very well, quietly doing very well. Uh, Japan has an excellent marketing uh, image in Asia. 
Uh, and uh, despite uh, political difficulties, uh, Japan, Japanese goods are seen to be uh, of high quality and, uh, and, uh, and very desirable. Just uh, some final uh, conclusions here. Um, and I'm sorry I've taken as long as I have. The, uh, uh, Japan is, is really uh, an, in an integral part of Northeast Asian growth pole. Uh, what exactly the nature of that is, I think, still remains where the, the jury is out, and we're looking at it and hope that there's a wider community looking at this as well. Economic ties between uh, the two colossuses, Japan and, and, and uh, China, are particularly significant. I think we need to recognize the growing interdependence of, uh, of a triangle, not just, uh, a, uh, not just a, a bilateral relationship between Japan, China, and the USA, as I was mentioning, both in terms of production and consumption patterns, China uh, as, a, uh, as a means of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, uh, assembling uh, Japanese, uh, uh, contributing Japanese components and then re-exporting, re but also the global impact of, of, uh, along the financial uh, and monetary lines that I was just mentioning. Um, clearly, more work needs to be uh, needs is required on the impact of Northeast Asian economic integration on Canadian interests, risks and opportunities. Increasingly, we're starting to look at uh, specific sectors. We're just at the beginning of that. What does this mean for the automobile sector? What does this mean for uh, for the electronic sector? How does this? Clearly, there there, there may be risks, and there, but there also may be opportunities, and we need to start thinking about this strategically, and uh, that's going to be uh, a, a good deal of. Uh, well, a, a good proportion of some of the uh, of our focus in, in in Tokyo, working with our, our colleagues uh, throughout the uh, throughout the Northeast Asian region. Um, and then once again, um, uh, this is very much a, a process which uh, is spurred uh, by uh, looking at Northeast Asia uh, in in a new in a new way. Uh, we've been certainly prompted to do this by recognition that we've had 75 years uh, and uh, of, of uh, working with uh, with Japan. But uh, it's, it's time to, to rethink. It's time to look at things in, in, in new ways. And, um, and uh, we're, we're trying to engage dialogue and I look forward to, uh, to continuing that uh, here with you uh, now. Thank you very much. expect integration to take place much beyond the economic type of integration. Mm -hmm. But with Japan's aging population, are demographics not going to drive greater integration? Because if you take out the manufacturing sector and add the service sector, yes. the Japan will not be able to supply the employee, uh, employment needs uh, without uh, immigration. And that uh, because of the linguistic similarities between Korea and Japan and China and Japan, that they become a great source of immigration, and that the integration of the economies, perhaps not in the midterm, but certainly the longer term, there's some prospects that uh, across a wide spectrum that there would be greater integration simply because of Japan's need for people. Indeed, uh, I've, um, I, I do feel somewhat remiss because I've, I've actually been speaking to this at some length. It is a key uh, challenge for Japan. Japan is a country of almost 130 million people, uh, that, uh, of which right now one in, uh, in five is over the age of 65, and by 2006 one in, uh, one in four, and at that point uh, Japan will start to, uh, the Japanese population will start to decline in absolute terms, uh, looking at possible scenarios of, uh, of a country of, a, of, a, of a only 100 million people within, within 50 to 75 years. So this is a real, uh, a real, uh, uh, a real challenge, obviously, and it's a challenge also from a financial perspective because not only is it, are you have a declining, popu a declining population, but you also have a, a, a long living population, which a smaller, a much smaller cohort is going to have to support in terms of pensions and health care and, uh, and so forth uh, on the basis of quite a, bit, a very high standard uh, now in Japan. Health is the number one issue in Japan. If an election would call today, it would be about health. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's what the polling indicates at this point in time, uh, in the from domestic perspective. Now, um, some of these issues are working themselves out now. Uh, the Philippine, uh, uh, Filipino uh, Japan FDA, which will be uh, getting underway in a while, um, is, uh, has at its core uh, the notion of free uh, movement of people. 
between Japan and the, and the Philippines. And the Japanese remain are concerned that this, this, uh, there has been some, uh, some um, uh, abuse of that uh, system, particularly in terms of the uh, movement of so-called entertainers, which has often brought people who uh, had other intentions in mind, a uh, sort of criminal, uh, criminal uh, side to that. Um, and uh, there is, uh, but, but the Japanese need Filipino um, uh, nurses and doctors and, and technicians and so forth. Um, and that's going to be a very interesting test. I think in the short term, and even the medium term, it's hard to see Japan, or the homogeneous society, opening itself up rapidly. There are still concerns in Japan, uh, I mean, very strong concerns, uh, I think, at, at the, at, uh, at the level of the population. Uh, about uh, about the uh, what they view as a as a correlation between increasing crime and the number of, of, of foreigners in Japan, uh, I'll pass on judgment on that. But uh, the, it certainly is something which is, is uh, widely felt uh, in, in Japan, uh, for for better for, for, for right or for wrong. Uh, and so it is hard. I think it takes time. It takes time, and it requires a process of, of Japanese thinking about themselves. And here I think it's, uh, there's an important uh, process of reckoning going on in Japan. Uh, the, the economic uh, superstructure or the super tanker that is Japan does not turn on a dime. There are some things going to be done now, but some things are going to take much longer. If you look at, uh, and particularly from, if you put in politics along with the economics, it's going to take a while to, to come to terms with uh, many of these issues. What is, what is happening in Japan, however, uh, as a part of this overall process, is, uh, is uh, an important, uh, uh, is really happening on the external scene. And here I think you need to look at the, um, the uh, at Japan's recent uh, uh, deployment to, uh, to Iraq as a fundamental change for Japan. Japan has been, uh, has been, has had a pacifist constitution, uh, and, and you'll all be aware of, 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 the, of, the, of the, the history of that. But increasingly Japanese are looking to be more uh, autonomous, not necessarily nationalistic, but autonomous, and to be what they call in Japan a, a normal country. Having Japanese troops in on the on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the television every night in Japan is changing things. When they originally, uh, when Koizumi uh, originally uh, uh, sent uh, troops or announced sending troops to Japan, and he sent them in in, drip, in drips and drabs. Uh, you, initially, the, the public was against, and then you saw it going up, and it went ticked over the 50 percent, and, and it, it's changing. It's getting Japanese to think about themselves, and uh, in that sense, uh, what, what uh, Prime Minister Koizumi is, is, is doing is quite interesting. Deploy to Iraq, change Japan, and it's a process of, of cogitation, and it's going to take a while. But it is, it goes much further than that, and I think that if one can, it, it, as you look at Japanese looking at, it, at, their, at their role in the world, Japan is 20% of, of, of UN dues, but, uh, of the UN system, but it doesn't have a fortunate place. If you add all these things together, there's, there's more and more of a, of a sense of, of who are we and, and, and what should our role be in the world. And that also leads to a process of cogitation which I think will, uh, will force Japan to look at its, itself uh, in terms of its more domestic uh, uh, issues, including some things like immigration. Uh, change does not happen quickly in Japan, uh, and I think that, uh, but one must, one must look at, uh, uh, at this as not so much a uh, you know, same old, same old, but a process, a longer term process of reflection in Japan, which is underway now. Sorry, a long answer to, uh, to a good question, please. And you briefly mentioned about the threat of uh, North Korea. I'd like to sort of take a, an opposite perspective with an opportunity with China. And I think it's inevitable that China uh, in, a, in a generation will become a democracy. And, and you always talk, you've talked a few times about things under the radar screen. And I'd, I'd be interested in your views about what's happening in China to move that way. And how is that going to change? This whole uh, integration thing. I think I think you, you cannot integrate unless you have a, a similar political systems and, and political values. And, and I think that that's sort of a prerequisite. Democracies are not going to integrate with uh, dictatorships, never. And so I think it's a significant stepping stone toward the broader political integration uh, down down the line. And I like your, your views about uh, Chinese democracy and what, what that could or could not do. Thank you. Well, I'm, as, as you know, I'm, I'm from the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo, so I'm, I'm not as, uh, as, as there are people in this room who are much more knowledgeable about what's happening in China than myself. 
What I can tell you is that that is very much a view held in Japan for one year to stay there. How, how do we go about, how do we deal with, 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 with this massive neighbor, which is becoming more and more, uh, more, and more significant and more and more sophisticated, uh, but, but one but is, uh, is, uh, is obviously struggling to deal with uh, uh, disparities and, uh, and is, uh, is changing itself. Um, and I think that uh, uh, the view, there's a very vibrant debate in Japan about this. It's in the papers, it's, in, uh, it's, it's on television, uh, it's, uh, it's very much a, a subject of a, a long going discussion. Um, I think that there is, there is less of a sense of threat about, uh, about, uh, about exactly that because there is a sense that China itself is changing. Uh, the simple notion that, uh, uh, that, that for example, the uh, uh, the, uh, the Communist uh, uh, Party is now looking at, uh, at recognizing a private, uh, uh, private uh, uh, property is, is very, very significant, and this has been taken note of in Japan. Uh, Japanese firms have had a long, a long, difficult time as Canadian firms in dealing with uh, a country which does not, uh, it was from their perspective, does not uh, uh, respect the rule of law on, on issues like technology, uh, uh, tech transfer, and so forth. That's their perspective, and. It is a perspective shared by, by Canada, um, d despite the the, 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 the efforts of the, of the Chinese uh, uh, the Chinese government. It's not enough, and it, but it's it's emblematic of we're we're still a long way apart. And I, I think that uh, uh, there is a uh, there's a sense that we're going to get there, but for the time being, there is this there there is this uh, this gulf which, which separates us, and it's going to take a long time until. You have uh, the ability to have free uh, movement of goods and uh, and people, which is, for example, the hallmark of of, uh, of a grouping like the European Union. I think there, there's very much a sense of that in Japan. Please. Uh, following on from that, but in a sense challenging that. The, I totally agree with the, the point that you make that the, the integration is being driven by private sector investment, by the development of the uh, the international supply chain. But then as happened in North America. But then when you try to draw the analogy, and it may be happening this way in Asia, I think there's a big fallacy. In North America, the dominant economic and financial power is also the dominant political and geopolitical power. This is certainly not the case in Asia, where the dominant economic power at the moment is, China, is Japan and will continue to be so. There's we could debate for hours the dominant political power, and, and that rivalry is not going to go away. And in terms of a financial power, there is no financial integration in Northeast Asia as there was in North America. So I, I think it's fanciful to, to use North America as any sort of an example other than to say business integration is taking place in North America, took place in North America, and, 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 and drove an economic integration and something similar seems to be happening in Northeast Asia, but that's where it's going to end. I, I think that uh, certainly we would share that, that, that we share that perspective. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, this is more meant to provoke than, than, to, uh, than, than to, to give an absolute statement. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think it's it's it's, an, it's a useful hypothesis, and I think that the hypothesis becomes particularly useful when you compare not Canada and the U.S., but Canada and the U.S. and, and versus Mexico. Where you have partners of different uh, of different uh, uh, economic makeup, a very sort of national, entirely nationalized oil industry in Mexico, for example, and, uh, very very different types of uh, of integration. I think that's where we need to spend more more time and more effort because that's where you might find more truth. So uh, you know, uh, again, I, I, we would we would agree it's a very it's uh, but it's, it's not a bad testing ground. Throw an idea out, see how it works, and uh, uh, there's no there's no real precedent for this. But it's it's a mat matter of hypothesis, so so, uh, so thank you. Uh, would certainly it would be difficult to disagree. Sorry, questions over here. Yeah. Just a comment. I think it would uh, be almost like a kiss of death if uh, anyone tried publicly to link uh, business-driven economic uh, integration, if you want to call it that, or call it alliance or uh, investment relations, or whatever, with. Uh, any form of political immigration. It simply wouldn't happen if they were linked. And I think it's much better uh, that you simply let it happen and then readjust government policies to reflect the reality. So what's been happening anyway? No, I think that it's, it's interesting. I think the Japanese are, are somewhat frustrated. They're frustrated that the Doha Development Round has not come forward. 
Uh, everyone has their own role to play in that process, but uh, you know, including Japan. But it, it's not moving at the state. They are they're much more comfortable with multilateral negotiations than with the sort of one-on-one. -on -one. And, and they just have no experience. The only FDA that they have uh, negotiated is so far is with Singapore and just recently with Korea and even there, uh, excuse me, with uh, with uh, Mexico and even there, it uh, it is only, they could not absolutely nail down all all parts of the deal in terms of the of the most sensitive issue, agriculture. So there, the Japan it is not the the, uh, the the clear Japanese preference is to negotiate in, in a wider context. Uh, so this really doesn't suit them all that much. But there are certainly uh, many people in Japan will tell you that the, the move towards the FDAs is not just because there's a void uh, at regional, in the FDAs in the region, it's not just because there's a void in the Doha development round and the WTO, but because um, they're being faced with a, a very vibrant China, which from their perspective is working largely on, uh, on the basis of a politically motivated uh, process and not an economically motivated process. Japan, I think, would, would have preferred to wait. And I see my Japanese colleagues, uh, with whom I work every day, they are reorganizing into uh, into a new uh, uh, a new uh, force each each department and so forth to deal with uh, uh, these FTAs. And when one senses that they're struggling with uh, uh, organization for something which is really uh, a bit of an unknown for them, um, and, and it's uh, it's interesting to 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 see the, the newness of, of that for for our Japanese colleagues. Please. Uh, a question. Uh, can you uh, sum up and just say a couple of a couple of points? Uh, what you would consider to be the major uh, implications in the way of opportunities, and also a couple in the way of constraints uh, for Canadian business, uh, given this scenario. Can you reduce those to a couple? Of it's. Uh, I think it's. It's it, well, as a caveat that it's difficult because we really don't know enough. Time, but there's enough to be to start to start wondering. Uh, first of all, I think we are concerned about, uh, about whether we know enough about investment flows and, and financial flows and what this means. Um, secondly, uh, do, we, uh, do we understand uh, what is actually happening in the area uh, in terms of, is there more happening in terms of real integration, which is going to change production patterns, which creates a real pull? Is, is China just a factory floor for the, for the world, or is it actually creating a real, a real pole? I think that's important for Canadians to know. Certainly in Mexico, there is real concern that China is just going to displace a significant chunk of, of Mexican industry. Canada is very united into, into, a, into something with, with the United States in that regard, but is that going to change American production patterns, and therefore our production patterns? Uh, consumption patterns, and therefore our production patterns? That's something which we need to, we need to understand. Um, and, and then I guess uh, I guess just uh, finally um, um, a question of of, um, uh, of uh, uh, whether or not we're properly set up to get the best advantage uh, of of what is happening here in in the area. If we understand what that is, are we investing in the right places? Are we do we have the right partnerships? It appears that our traditional bilateral export process uh, is not actually rendering the kind of, uh, of, uh, of growth, that, uh, capturing the growth which other, uh, which other countries are. Other um, uh, G, uh, G8 and uh, industrialized countries are doing much better than Canada. Do we need to rethink this? And are there new alliances which we need to make? I know it's difficult to do, to do uh, Canadian companies find it difficult to do work with Japanese companies, but is that something we need to get over? And, uh, and and start thinking uh, differently uh, about I, that. It's really a question of getting us to reflect, and that's why we're working on this. Uh, but we're a long way from answers, so that's a tentative uh, tentative uh, uh, attempt to respond. Hit this one. Um, I'd like to ask a question um, based on one of your opening remarks. That um, an FTA. Um, Northeast Asia is most probably not likely to take place in the midterm or in the longer term. Can an argument be made? And I don't have any, you know, I don't have any concrete thoughts of this. Can an argument be made that over time, actually, the incentive on China's part to integrate or form a free trade agreement with Japan uh, would actually decrease over time? Because as China modernizes, as it develops, and given the uh, the tension in relations, in the historical relations between the two countries itself, 
China often talks about techno globalism, but in fact it practices techno nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so, really, is there a role for Japan in the longer term? Is there, I mean, is there going to be a greater incentive, or is that incentive going to be uh, used over time? I think there's really sort of two different levels of questions there, but, but um, first of all, I should just make one little correction. Um, I, I said that I didn't think that overall integration, way, in fact, well beyond the free trade agreement, the kind of free trade, uh, uh, free free movement of goods and services and, uh, and people, uh, of the type of the European Union, is unlikely in, in the medium uh, to the, uh, the longer term. I, I think that uh, most people would agree with that. An actual free trade agreement with, uh, with between China, Japan, Korea uh, is actually being considered. Whether it would actually happen is still very much under discussion. I think that would be the subject to uh, experience of, of how, how other FTAs work and so forth. But, uh, but again, that, that there's a lot which, which plays into that, and uh, uh, we'll have to see how that goes. But that, that is actually under consideration, actively under consideration at this point in time. Um, in terms of the more strategic question that you asked, I, I think it's quite fundamental to Japan. Uh, they, they have based their economy and they can see that it works on the base of at least a chunk of their economy which is performing now uh, is, is, is making their, their uh, Japanese techno-nationalism is actually performing and they want to keep that advantage. The biggest Japanese concern I think at this point in time, uh, which uh, one can fully understand, is that uh, high-tech, high-value proprietary uh, 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 pro uh, property will, will, will escape you know, over the longer term and a, a much uh, more populous uh, uh, China, uh, even Korea, uh, but, but, uh, but certainly not, not just China, uh, will, uh, w which has uh, uh, seemingly endless amounts of, of well-trained uh, 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 well science and scientists and technicians and so forth, will, will take over this technology. I think it's a, it's a fundamental issue for Japan, and you can see recently the discussion which this brought about when Sony broke from the traditional Japanese mold and made a, a new partnership with Samsung. That, uh, that, cross, uh, that partnership uh, across the, 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 uh, the Sea of Japan is really fundamental and has got some of the strategists in Tokyo very concerned about how about what happens with real with real partnership where uh, potentially highly profitable Japanese uh, technology escapes into the uh, across Japan's borders. Um, there's also big questions I think about about uh, uh, from a policy perspective about what what is happening uh, and the, the hollowing out of some parts of Japan. Increasingly, uh, there is concern about a two-tier Japan, Tokyo, and maybe some other cities. You know, right down to Nagoya, for example, China, and now some Japanese, some some firms which actually were in Southeast Asia into China, uh, because it's even lower cost there. Uh, and 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 what is the what are the social implications of that? Uh, to what extent do the do, do firms which go off site off off uh, offshore really contribute to wealth in Japan, wealth and social building the nation in Japan? Uh, one issue, one uh, company which is used as an illustration of this is Uniqlo. This is the Japanese, a Japanese company which uh, sourced, uh, which started uh, fabricating very, very good quality and very cheap clothes in, in China and exporting them back to Japan. Uh, Uniqlo doesn't even have a headquarters in Japan anymore. Yet it's considered to be a, a major, you know, a Japanese success story of, of going offshore and making money and, and changing Japan. And most people now have a uh, have, a, have an appetite for for, for cheaper clothes. But what is this doing for the social engineering? What does this contribute to a Japan which needs to change, as we were, we were discussing before? There's a lot of reflection going on about this uh, in, in the government and in think tanks and so forth. So uh, what does this mean for Japan in the longer term? I think it's got people really transfixed right now. Please. Uh, I'd like to follow up on something you touched on. And maybe you can elaborate and talk a little bit about what's going on under the radar screen, if you can. Um, you showed a slide with a uh, triangle mm -hmm. showing savings running from China to the U.S., from Japan to the U.S. There's an article today um, in the New York Times about Japan's uh, manipulation of its currency by buying U.S. dollars or selling yen or whatever the, the, the daily thing may be, which reports that... Um, Japan has been a consumer, a buyer, 
of over 50% of all U.S. Treasury offerings in the recent period. Japan now holds the largest foreign currency uh, stash in the world, of about $777 billion, according to this morning's New York Times. Um, there's a lot of pressure from the U.S. on China, apparently, to adjust and let its currency float. Japan seems to be cooperating with the U.S. to some degree in letting its currency be manipulated, or manipulating its currency. Um, where do you think this is all going? There's like competitive devaluations, different people can adjust all of your trade and export numbers by fiddling around with the respective currencies, including George Bush. What do you see going on, and where do you see that going? Well, uh, as you, you just given some figures as to, to what I was talking about earlier, uh, but uh, this issue has been around for, for coming up for a little while, uh, but uh, I guess the person who really rang the alarm bell was Alan Greenspan last week, when he noted, last week or perhaps just a little before, who noted that, that this, is a, this is not only something which may be a concern for the U.S., because they're not really, according to, uh, according to his... Uh, his uh, perspective, they're not really dealing with, uh, with their deficit the, 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 way, the way they should, uh, but also that this may not be working for Japan. Now, Japan is, uh, because it's going to end up with so many Amer American denominated assets that you know, it, it just skews the whole process. So uh, you're into a, an area of, of major, uh, you know, uh, potentially changing the, the monetary system. Uh, the, the figures are so big. China, but manipulation is, I think you need to be careful with manipulation. I mean, China has, it's hard to see why, uh, where the direct Chinese interest in, in, in renominating, uh, uh, revaluing the, the renminbi is because it really suits China's purposes at this point in time, although some who and certainly would, would, would mainly help. But from, from Japan's perspective, this is something which is, is clearly being done in order to slow down the rate of depreciation, of depreciation in the yen. It's not being done for, for, for other purposes. It, it does serve that purpose, at least temporarily. The question is, what happens, you know, at what point does it end, and, and uh, at what point does it know, does the, does the, uh, the, effect, the, the effect of affecting the global uh, balance become more important than affecting, than, than, than the temporary effect of slowing down the creation of the end? I think that's what the debate is now, and um, I don't think anybody has the answer, let alone me. If I could just follow up just to this extent, it seems to me from your slides again, if I'm a Japanese company as opposed to the government, I can get a much better return on my yen, my dollar, in China or at least elsewhere in Northeast Asia. I'm reading the same papers as everybody else. Even Warren Buffett is moving out of U.S. dollars and has concerns about U.S. assets. And here's Japan holding the largest, you know, cumulative group of U.S. assets in the world. How long is that going to continue? <laughs> right. That's right. I think that's, that's, that's the question. And then what and happens? They, you know, I, I'm not, not qualified to, to, uh, to take it any further than that. Please. In a sense, answering that, as long as Japanese interest rates remain at zero, they, you know, the, the, the Bank of Japan can afford to print money, buy dollars, and then issue bonds to sop, up, sop it up to cost them nothing. Meanwhile, they're getting a much bigger return, even though two and a half percent from U.S. Treasuries, than they would. In their home market. But they have, a decline, they have a declining asset in U.S. dollars. No. But if the yen went down, then it would go the other way. It's, the, point, the point is, as long as it's painless for them, yeah. they, keep, they can keep on doing it. Yeah. But what, what Don Greenspan was saying is that there's a point where it will no longer be painless. So the, yeah, well, that, when it's not being painless, yeah. I'll have to stop. So, uh, but that's but that's that's exactly it. In, in any case, it's 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 new, it's interesting, and it's uh, and it's big. Uh, and it's something which Canada needs to pay attention to. So when, if we just look at Japan in terms of our bilateral relationship, we're making a mistake, I think. With increasing global integration and regional integration, you need to think you know, bilaterally, sort of trilaterally, and, uh, and globally at the same time. And we need to readjust our thinking to deal with all those things simultaneously. Because same old, same old with Japan just isn't, isn't going to work anymore. Other other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, uh, on behalf of the uh, Ivan Lam Center and Simon Fraser University, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, eye-opening, ear-opening uh, presentation. Um, and uh, you know, if you don't have any.
Scottish regime. Yeah, uh, certainly do. You know, then, uh, then I would like to leave you with this, or like you to leave us with this uh, small but raucous uh, uh, set of CDs uh, from the uh, uh, world champion uh, pipe. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Just uh, thank thank all of you. Um, uh, I'm on a mentioning. I work working in cross Western Canada, and I have a, 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 a couple of different presentations. But the one which is the least certain is, is the one which I, I just uh, I just gave, and we very much uh, it's it's the one which required the most imagination is, is, is this one, and only Simon Fraser picked this one up. So I, I it's a tribute to you and the imagination in this organization. So. Thank you. We have some refreshments uh, behind the wall here that has been delivered, coffee, tea, snacks. Please feel free to uh, stick around and pursue any questions or comments you might have. Uh, thank you very much for coming.